This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Hello everybody and good afternoon. How awesome is this? We're kicking off our sunset safari with of course an Avoca male. How awesome is that? Well, welcome aboard everyone. I am Trishala and I've got Seb on camera with me. And we are of course coming to you from Juma Private Game Reserve here on the western fringes of the Kruger National Park. Now do remember to interact with us and use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or of course the YouTube chat stream to ask us any questions you'd like about these lovely Avoca males that we've got here. Now we do have two. So we've got this guy right here was quite tired as lions do in the middle of the day find a good spot of shade although I think he could have done a bit better with his choice of shade but maybe he wants a bit of sun on him too he's absolutely beautiful and I always love to spend time with the avoca males because I think that they're absolutely majestic yeah I agree Ooh, I'm sorry about my sound or if I sound a bit funny but i actually think that my mic has come out yes it has there we go i'm sorry if i sound very funny but i'm just going to fix this very quickly yes that's my idea of quick <laughs> i hope that will be better just give me a Hello, hello, is that better? Yay, I'm so sorry, guys. But like I was saying, we're speaking about these Avoca males. So we have the one here and there's one behind us as well. Well, not quite behind us, a little, a little distance behind us. So I will keep up with them for most of the day, I think today, until unless they feel a bit too sleepy, but I don't want to lose them once the sun starts to set, you see. Absolutely stunning. Now this gives you a really good impression of how these can be so camouflaged. Cheryl, you say this is an amazing start. I couldn't agree with you more. This is an excellent start. I'm so glad that we found them. Now you can see in, this, in the really brown sort of dried up grass and the sun that's hitting on it. These animals are really well camouflaged. Oh, something just bothered him. Now, if we're th wondering about who we've got here, he only picked his head up uh, very briefly, so I didn't get a very obvious look at him. But he is either the blonde or the dark mane the Volker, because I think the Mohawk one is behind us. Look at the flick of the tail. Now, it's really awesome to see these animals in their natural environment and something I'm really thankful for because so often most people see animals like this in zoos. And I mean, it's one thing and they're still absolutely amazing, but to see them in their natural environment, they're choosing to be here and choosing to sit down right here is just amazing. I love how he swats himself every now and then with the little tuft of his tail. This is very exciting. I think I'm as excited as you guys are. I always love to see them, especially when you see their faces and you think, wow, what an amazing animal. Now, for those of you who don't know, the Avoca males are the dominant coalition in this area. And the lions that you may be familiar with, the Incahumas, which is the resident pride here, basically, kind of belong to this coalition. And it's three of them. We've got the dark maned, the blonde mane, and the mohawked male. And they were born in about 2013. And you can see that they have these nice, big, beautiful mane. Anyway, I'm going to stick around with them. Of course I am. How could I leave them? This is an excellent start to the show. Well, let me send you over to James and see if he can even trump this. Wow. I am the 
the ghost of the wilderness, and I am driving the car today. Ooh. You can ask me any questions you like using the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter, or just think the question and I will answer it for you. <laughs> Not really, it was me. <laughs> I know you're very surprised. Hello. Welcome to the Sunset Safari. As Trishala has explained to you, we are gearing up for television. The pressure is not quite as profound as it was last week when we had nothing at the start of the drive. Now we've got two flat lions uh, who will almost certainly walk west off the reserve at about 29 minutes past six. And Jamie Patterson will hopefully also be heading towards Beefle's Hook Waterhole fairly soon to show you Tingana, who has been there for quite some time. Lauren will have been sitting in the sun for roughly five hours. By the time Jamie gets there, she's been babysitting Tingana. And so, well, we've got a little bit of cat action at least this afternoon. Our plan is to, well, apart from just enjoying the very pleasant temperature of the Sunday afternoon, is to head down sort of around the Trias Dam area, which is central south, and central, 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 around the Mati drainage system, because Herbert is on foot around the area looking for Tlalamba. David, there is the animal that uh, you and I will remember very well from last night's rehearsal. It is, in fact, a diker that is not on... There we go, you've got it there. Well done. That one has got a particularly impressive unicorn. That is, of course, a diker U, and I think we think that that unicorn is there as a sort of deterrent. It's just hair. I had a unicorn when I was at school, David. Yes, I had a piece of hair that wouldn't sit down. It was very embarrassing. It looked like I hadn't brushed my hair. It's not a mohawk. No, I wasn't brave enough for a mohawk, David. <laughs> Right, let's continue along here. Trishala's powerful voice is coming over the airwaves at the moment. So Rusty and Herbie were tracking Tlalamba over there. What he? Oh. Um, and the tracks came into that area over there, which looks like very good leopard country indeed. And so Herberto has very kindly offered to help us try and find her this afternoon and we will do our best to give him a hand, which will probably mean we'll just drive around aimlessly until he finds something for us. That's not true. I was having a talk with Jamie today, and she said, she said to me, this is something I must confess, there are very few things I realized before Jamie Patterson, but this thing I definitely did realize before her. And we were talking about the fact that many people say that they are tracking a leopard. I'm going to go and track a leopard. Well, what they actually mean is, I'm going to go and find a leopard track, and then I'm going to blunder about in the general vicinity of where that track was made. And if I find the leopard, uh, I will say that I've tracked it. But in actual fact, what will have occurred is that it stepped out in front of me, or I've managed to spot it, or I nearly rode over it, or I kicked it out of a bush, basically. Because it is so hard, unless you have the skills of Herbert, skills born of not a three-month training course or a year-long training course but of years and years and years of refining the craft all right let's go across to jamie now she broke her aerial as she drove out of camp and i think marcel has now fixed it It is fixed, it is fixed. Many thanks to Marcel. A very good afternoon to you all. Welcome to my portion of the Sunset Safari. My name is Jamie and this afternoon Craig is behind the camera. And we got off to a truly auspicious start. We were probably about 50 meters outside of the camp. I went over a bump and the antenna went bloop. It was actually quite funny. It just kind of <laughs> broke. 
I guess. <laughs> it was it was probably more entertaining if you were there. It was one of those had to be there moments, but I thought it was hilarious. <laughs> anyway, uh, it's it's wear and tear through years of driving over bumps or however long the antenna's been up there. And the plastic broke, but naturally because I was driving, you can imagine the jokes are going to flow for days to come until people forget about it. Oh, cheaper squirrel. It made it back in the grass. Phew. My word, please. Don't add to the stress of my afternoon. It just bounced out almost under my tire there. Whew. My word. The environment is not being kind to my, my poor adrenal glands. And once upon a time, a broken antenna before a TV show would have driven me mad with sheer stress. But now it was just funny. Now I just laughed at it. Uh, uh, yes. Um, apparently, James did let the cat out of the bag. Obviously, poor old Lauren has had to sit much longer than intended to babysit Tingana, for which I am deeply, deeply thankful. We're making our way there now. I'm still ages away. I'm just, less, just left camp now. I'll get there eventually. I'm not too worried. He'll start moving in the next half an hour or so. I am worried that he's just going to go bye-bye into Buffalo's Hook in time for the TV show, but at least you guys will get to see him before he does that. That's my standard TV luck. Lions, gone. Leopard, gone. So, you know. But, and also, of course, a big thank you to Sydney, who was the one who ultimately found him this sort of in the middle of the day today. We had relay, t we had relay teams. So I went out this morning as soon as it got light, and then everybody jumped on board and searched for animals from there. And, of course, as we finished morning drive, we got the report that the lions had come wandering across onto Juma. Speaking of which, off you pop across to Trishala so I can put my foot down and get, and relieve, get to relieve Lauren. Now, I've got some really cute paws here, don't you think so? I know it's not the word usually associated with large male lions, but I do think that they're very, very cute. Now we've been joined by another vehicle too. So if you hear people chattering in the background, that's probably what it is. It's definitely not emanating from the lion. <laughs> stunning. Now, he doesn't look as if he's eaten too much. You can see that it's slightly rounded there, but not quite, so I hope they'll get something. Robert, you'd like to know if there's another male coalition that's a threat to the evokers. Well, the only one I could think of were the Birmingham boys, and they have moved further south, so I doubt that they would actually come back this way considering that they vacated the area it's not as if they had really as if the evoker males had fought for this territory they sort of just left it vacant and the evoker males came in so at the moment i don't really think there is going to be any issues or there are going to be any issues for these males and everything seems to be going smoothly so far not that I'm any Dr. Full on lion social kind of relationships, but I feel like the Incahumas and them, it's a nice sort of stable lion family. It would be interesting to see what would happen if other males come in. About... I think it was about a month ago, close to the Manialeti boundary, I had seen another male that was actually not... I mean, if he wanted to come in here, he could come in here. Apparently, he had wandered in from the Kruger. Probably a nomadic male that's just kind of moving about, maybe trying to join a coalition, if it's slightly younger. But it definitely hasn't strolled down this way. And if it had, it would mean quite ferocious fights. In fact, fights to the death if, if he didn't retreat. 
And you'll find that they might, may fight amongst themselves as well, between the evokers, as in within their coalition, they would fight, especially when it comes to, uh, around mating time, or even around a carcass, they might. But when I say fight, it's more of a, of a scuffle. They hardly hurt each other, unless there is a major, I suppose, they have big differences, there's really no need to fight, because it doesn't benefit them to be able to fight. Now I can hear lots of <laughs> Richards, you say the evoker male is your spirit animal right now. I think so. I think it's brave and powerful and majestic. Is that what you are? Clearly that is what you are. Now I'm turning in this direction because I can hear impalas just I can't see them yet, but in that direction I can hear them. And there were even some behind us. And um, they are very, very noisy, as usual, in the rutting season. But I thought that maybe it would get the attention of these guys. But clearly they're too tired and it is too hot. Although I didn't think it was that hot today. But maybe they just need a rest. They're not hungry just yet. Or they just don't have the energy to do anything about it just yet. Look at that foot. <laughs> I like that. You say, I couldn't get the name there. It was Vob? Vob? <clears throat> hmm? Oh, bald. Bold? <laughs> so sorry, but you say that you love seeing lions lying around. Oh, I do love it. I love a cheesy joke. Absolutely do. Even better than a cheesy joke is a cheesy joke with a bit of science in it. Then I feel particularly nerdy. Very cute. So after this, I think I might go out and see what the other one is doing. Robert, you'd like to know when we name, when will we name these boys? Well, as far as I know, when it comes to lions, or really most big, um, high-profile animals here, we don't particularly, or we're not particularly involved in naming them on our own. So it has a lot to do with the other other lodges that are around and all of that. It's not as if they belong to us. If that makes sense. So, for me, until the name comes along, we just kind of use descriptive names, like you would have heard, mohawked male, blonde male, dark baned male. So we use these descriptive names, and it's really helpful because it can, we can tell who's who just by the name, it just helps with memory as well. But they'd have to be a, a trio of some sort, I think. It is a beautiful day in the African bush. Look at that sunlight just creeping through. The birds are going. It is beautiful. Flickings off the ears. All these horrible pests that sometimes irritate them induce this little reflex of the ears and the tail. You would have seen that. And it's the same way as you kind of automatically swat when something lands on you or scratch it's almost just an automated response now i want to swing round because he looks like he's fairly put and have a look at the other evoca male but while i do that let me send you over to james and see how his search is going Well, it's not going too badly. I was feeling slightly insulted, though, I must tell you. Insulted I was feeling because not one of you has complimented me on my haircut. And I, I feel that that's not very fair. Not even David, who's on camera, even noticed I'd had a haircut. I think it's very unfair. Anyway, I'll get over it eventually. And you won't see it, but it's very bald. Shiny. 
funny, isn't it? <laughs> a little bit like Kojak. A little bit of fuzz on top. Oh, apparently I missed a spot in the back. Did I? No. Oh, yes, I did. There it is. <laughs> Not too bad. That scar, by the way, if you're interested. Yeah, is when I fell on my grandmother's ashtray as a youngster. Yeah. Thank you. This is world-class safari, everybody. Don't get this on an ordinary game drive. <laughs> All my follicles are dead, David. Andrew, you make a valid point. You say there's a difference between a shave and a haircut. Yes. Yes, I think that's fair. Um, I suppose I've had more of a shave, haven't I? And that's what I do with a shaver. <laughs> right, so we've had an update from Herbie, and Herbie has found some more tracks. Those tracks are heading towards the sort of area to the south of quarantine clearings, which are just south of the camp, just next to the camp. So possibly heading towards the waterhole here uh, by way of avoiding the hyena den, but possibly just hunting. I think she's just hunting. And I think that if you keep your eye out on the dam cam, that's gonna be your best bet for chances of Tlalamba. But we'll keep trying. There's also little giraffe calf tracks here. It's a lovely afternoon. Apart from the fact that I didn't shave very well. Anyway, we'll also try and find some other interesting creatures. There's something on the top of that termite mound. I think it's another piece of termite mound. Yes, look at that, David. Gorgeous top of the termite mound. Huh. Thank you, Mr. Nomondris, you say. The bald and the beautiful. <laughs> Am I the bald and is David the beautiful? Not sure that that's... I'm happy about that. It was just a termite mound that looked a little bit like a leopard. It was around here, I'm not sure if any of you remember, or I'm sure some of you remember, that we had Tandy and Tlalamba together. And, no we didn't, sorry, we had only Tandy. And Tandy was looking for Tlalamba and she spent about uh, two hours sort of calling and calling around here. And we thought perhaps that something terrible had happened. But it was very characteristic of Tlalamba in her early years because, or her early months, because she was fiercely independent from almost the word go. All right, let's go back to Jamie Paterson. She's made her way to the northeast corner, Biffle's Hook, with a surprise. <laughs> I have made my way to Biffle's Hook, but look, 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 look what we've got here. It must be James's misty honey badger, only it's no longer misty. How oh, cool is this? Sorry, Tingana is here, um, but he is currently settled down on the dam wall and he's not moving. So obviously we are extremely excited about this honey badger that is currently drinking from one of the mud puddles. Well, I think it's drinking. It could also, of course, be digging for something as well, possibly a frog. You can get all sorts of things, maybe even catfish in the bottom of this dam. Although I think looking at its face now when it pops back up, I think it might be water. How cool is this? This is the best afternoon ever. There's a leopard. There's a hippo. Sorry? Ah, uh, okay. Um, Craig's having an issue with his camera, Faith. Uh, we need to actually just try and sort that out quickly. Obviously as quickly as possible. This is a truly auspicious afternoon. It's bizarre. Oh, hello. Okay. All right. We'll be back shortly, guys. We're going to send you across to Trish while we problem solve the camera, and we'll be back, hopefully. Oh, 
Well, I have come to the other male now, and we have mohawked male here. You can see he's really obvious because he has kind of male pattern baldness at the top. <laughs> Just a little bit, but it's really obvious. Now, he tends to be a little bit skittish, and he was when I first entered here, and they were kind of split. I thought, let me come to him first, because he was not asleep. But as soon as he saw me moving towards him, he was just kind of very skittish. But then when we sit with him for a few minutes, he gets fine and he's comfortable like he is now. It's always nice to have a lion that's awake in the day. But you can see that he's very sleepy. You look very tired, boy. You can see all those scratches on his face, which are sort of testament to, I suppose, all his experience. So pretty. Or oh, handsome, should I say. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to call you pretty. But I do think you're pretty, too. <laughs> Very lazy lions, as you can see. But I do hope that in the evening they will start to be on the move. They'll probably be on the move slightly earlier these days because the sun is setting earlier and the temperatures are lower. So who knows, maybe they may just go ahead and hunt. We'll be lucky. Anyway, let's go to Jamie with that honey badger that I'm so jealous about. We don't want to miss a moment of the honey badger. Unfortunately, it seems as though Craig has managed to sort out his camera issues. This is so exciting. I haven't seen a honey badger in forever. And I always enjoy them. They're one of my favorite animals, just obviously. I think most people feel this way. <clears throat> so what we're going to do is we're going to bring in a slightly wider audience, just because this is so, so exciting. Welcome, welcome to a truly unusual sighting at this time of day. A honey badger digging through the dried and cracked mud of a waterhole as we move off into our dry season. This, of course, is 100% live, and you're watching us here in the Greater Kruger National Park area of South Africa. So right up in the top sort of northeastern corner of one of the world's most beautiful countries. I'm biased, of course. And we've got an animal that we hardly ever get to see. They're very, very shy, but of course, an animal that most people are familiar with purely due to their fearsome reputation. So a honey badger, of course, is known for its uh, incredibly, for a tiny little creature, its incredibly gutsy behavior and the way in which it will tackle predators much, much larger than itself. <laughs> Alan says that he is so cute. He is really cute. And don't let, oh, look at him. He's covered in muddy water. Well, no, don't leave us. He's trotting away. There's some Franklin there. And it's really, really unusual. They are typically nocturnal creatures or largely nocturnal creatures. You do occasionally see them during the day. But their times that you actually get to see them are pretty rare. Now, that was really very, very cool. And there's actually quite a bit happening. There's a hippopotamus at the edge of the waterhole as well. <laughs> our Shelly, our honey badger's run off, but you want to know if he is fishing or if he was fishing. I think it's a possibility, Shelly. He might have been digging for water, but I think he was looking for frogs and fish in the dried up mud. There's so much happening here at the moment. It's really, really cool. So I think he was looking for something else. I think he was looking for food, and I think that's why that particular honey badger has been hanging around this water hole, which, of course, upsets the local inhabitants. Not that he'd be a threat to the hippopotamus.
Yes, Susan, it is. I'm pretty certain that it is the same honey badger that we saw the other day. This hippo's a little bit upset. It's not upset at us, though. No, you don't need to worry. There's so much going on at this waterhole. Shame. All of the animals get increasingly stressed out as their water dries up, and it's obviously particularly difficult for the hippopotamus of this area. We are going into the dry season. Patty, Patty says that this is such a beautiful sighting. Patty, it really, really is. It is a spectacular way to spend a Sunday afternoon. I really can't think of a better way to do so. He's moving down into the water. Shame, poor boy. Here he goes, scattering his dung with his tail. I remember that you can also ask your questions as well in the comments section. Now, Chris, you want to know if it's normal for the hippos to be around an area where there's no water. At this time of year, Chris, yes, it is. It really is, because there are certain areas where the water holes have retained a little bit of water, but they are chock-a-block full of hippopotamus at the moment. And for bulls, the males, like this one, it becomes very difficult for them to secure a spot in a place like that. So as a result, males that aren't able to compete with other males will actually need to will actually need to move out to other areas now I'm going to have to do some shuffling around in a moment and I'm probably going to have to move and turn around It's been amazing being joined by you all. Absolutely fantastic. I hope you enjoyed that honey badger sighting. And I hope that we get to see you again. Remember, if you want to see more of the safari, you can Google Safari Live and you will find us every day, twice a day. Hope you had fun and we'll see you on safari soon. Obviously, Scuba Steve is decidedly unsettled by all of the activity that's going on in the water around Tingana. So Tingana's lying on the dam wall. You can't see him from where I'm parked at the moment, but there are other vehicles here. And that's actually what ca is causing Steve's response, and that's why I was sort of getting a little bit nervy there at one point, because one of the vehicles is trapped, not trapped down there, but one of the vehicles is down there, and it's obviously he's now come down out of the drainage line he wasn't in the water when the vehicle made its way down there but he's now popped out of the bushes and he is discomforted hence why i was trying to suggest we might need to shuffle around so it's not us that he's upset with but there's absolutely nothing the guys can do except still sit still for a little bit and hopefully not add to any of his stress this is just what happens with hippopotamus when they are um, when they are in this kind of position where there's no water around so vehicle's going to try and move now while he's where he is and going to try and move out of the area that they're in i think they're going to manage to get around without getting too close to him that's what they're going to do they're going to give that a go All right, guys, while we try and sort this all out and I get you back into position to see Tingana. How cool was that? We saw a honey badger as well. We're going to send you across to Trishala, who is still with her lions. How awesome. Honey badger, Tingana, and these two. How awesome is that? That's actually very, very, very cool. It's going to be a great drive. Uh, this guy's still sussing us out just a little bit. He lifts his head up every now and then to give me a look. In fact, he gave me a yawn and a look of his lips earlier. 
I don't think you'll get too much meat off me. There, oh, there you go, there you go. And we're asleep. But not quite. <laughs> Oh, he looks quite... Oh, Sinak, what an interesting question. You'd like to know if I know whether nomadic males come from the Kruger to mate. Um, I, I really wouldn't know. I mean, a female in estrus is going to mate with any males that are around. But the problem is, you don't want these males to find out, basically. So the potential for it to happen is obviously there, but I don't know if that is the purpose of them moving out or just simply because they're nomadic males, they're constantly moving. But that's, that's really interesting. It'd be nice to be able to actually monitor a few males coming from there and actually see what they do when they get showed. It just transition through until they find a coalition or have they just... Oh, there's another really distinctive feature is that kind of uneven bit on his by his bottom incisors he's got a kind of can you see it there we go he's showing it to us <laughs> there's a little kind of kink yes thank you thank you you've been very good and kind in showing it to us but yes yes as we were saying about the nomadic males yeah i'm really not sure but the possibility is definitely there, as long as they don't get caught. I wouldn't want to be caught with one of these people's ladies. Look at them. They're going to smash <laughs> anyone else that comes in. But of course, only if they know. Since I've been here, at least, there hasn't been any other males that have come in. I mean, adult males. Of course, we had the Mangani male who came and the Telemati male. Oh, Linda, you say if we look closely at his nose, we'll be able to say, see the letter A for Avoca. Well done. Mr. Lion, you have labelled yourself very easily. So you can see now exactly why this is such an easy one to ID, because now that we know he's got an A on his nose, hopefully he'll show it to us. <laughs> he's eyeing us out properly, and if the one is closed, the other eye is a little bit open. <laughs> he seems restless. I wonder what it could be. Just not comfortable in your spot. Every now and then I can hear him when he kind of with his tongue and his mouth. Hopefully he'll do a do one slightly louder just now so you guys can hear it too. Oh, he looks adorable, slightly curled up there. Susan, you'd like to know if the evokers ever venture into the Kruger. Well, the Kruger is actually not that far from us, the boundary for the crew. It's just kind of beyond Bufosuk and Manieleti, I think. And as far as I know, these guys actually came from the Timbavati. So I'm not sure that they had needed to cross into the Kruger or whether they venture there because they, they can. But 
considering, like I had said, that there were other males around in that area who had already come in or come out of the Kruger towards the side, even though not very closely, I think that would deter these guys from being on the property at the same time or bringing that area at the same time as those other males. You see, even though animals do fight and they do defend territories quite fiercely, they don't want to be injured because if they're injured, it means that their fitness goes down. And they don't want their fitness to go down because that means that their survival or chance of survival is going to be lower. So that's not something that any animal wants. So they will really only fight if it's necessary for them to fight or they find that the outcome of the fight is more beneficial than the detriment of having that injury. So it's kind of... a uh, to find the, the kind of balance. So um, a lion or a leopard or any other kind of predator would rather avoid confrontation than actually actively go out and seek it. He's just finally turned in, I think. As soon as I turned to the camera, he eyed me out again. Oh, he reminds me of a house cat when he sits like that all curled up in a little bundle. Very sweet. <laughs> and the tail. You'll find that cats in general have a very interesting kind of lineage. And though they have are distantly, distantly related to our house cats and our smaller cats, the big cat line lineage is a sort of a bit of a mystery. But anyway, we'll talk about it a little more in a bit. Let's go and see how James' search for Tlalamba is going. Not well is the answer to that question. Not well at all. Uh, Herberto has continued to find more tracks, but he says that she's hunting. And that means she's going up and down or in local parlance, if a tracker is talking to his ranger who doesn't speak correct Shangan, he'd say, Mingonzo mienza lo up and down. <laughs> and that's what is going on. So they're going up and down because she's hunting, looking around the place, turning around, walking back the way, having a second thought, hearing an impala there, a bird call there. And so it's not easy to follow exactly where she's gone. Never mind, though. I know that all of you are very concerned for my efforts, but I shall prevail. I believe so today. And David's efforts, of course, when he is not feeding his face with biltong. Biltong, a South African delicacy, otherwise known as survival rations in the rest of the world, and as jerky. We've been through the Many times, I think, we've been through South African cuisine. Oh, unfortunately, because I don't have any animals, I'm going to be kept to a minimum length of segment. So we're going to go back to the leopard, because that's actually something worth looking at. I'm sorry, James, but we only just managed to get a good view of him. So... <laughs> We're going to cut you off. I promise you, you'll find an animal. Herbie will find Tlalumba for you. Or something. I don't know. This was James's choice, though. He did send me here, and he did send Trish to the lions. And I think that's just because that's the sort of person that he is. Mm -hmm. So there's Tingana. I promised you, up, up until James linked, we had a really lovely view of his face. Now we do not. But never fear, Scuba Steve has calmed down. He's back in his water. The vehicle is safe. All is well. So we'll be able to shift around. Hmm? Oh, is there an elephant coming? There's an elephant coming. Is that the limpy one? He's looking so much better. That is really, really good news. Oh, my word. And you see, this is why non-intervention is the policy taken by the, the various people in this area. My word, everything's coming to Buffalzip Dam. This is epic. Hey, little boy. He's looking okay, guys. He really is. He is definitely walking better than when I last saw him. 
coming for a drink. It's sore. He's limping badly. I don't know exactly what's wrong with him. Let's see if we can figure out which limb it is. I haven't managed to do that yet. Hey, my boy. Hello, you. So he's walked all the way from where James saw him yesterday to Buffalo's Hook Dam. I think he's going to be okay. Mm. Left front. No, right front, sorry. Although left front looks a bit wobbly as well. Ben says that he is so happy to see that he is doing so much better. I know, me too. I'm really relieved. You know, it's always a difficult thing, although he's going to now have to try and get around Scuba Steve. I don't think Steve's going to let him drink. I really don't. Already he's starting to snort at him. Oh, shame. And he's, he's smaller than Scuba Steve. He's going to be intimidated. Come on, Steve. He just wants a little bit of water. He's having such a rough time of things. Here you go, little one. There we go. A bit older than I thought he was, which is also good news. It could mean that he is a lot less stressed about being separate from the rest of his herd. They do start to develop a certain sense of independence at around about this age. Oh, it's definitely is... Look how swollen, I think, that right front wrist is. The wrist joint. That looks decidedly uncomfortable. That's where the injury is. Although now he's lifting up his back leg as well. I don't know what's going on here, to be honest. I'm not a hundred percent sure. Because no way the way he's holding that back leg is also I mean elephants do rest their weight on their hips. But Giraffe Girl wants to know if it could possibly be from a snake bite. Giraffe Girl, it's possible but highly unlikely. Typically because snakes tend to avoid trying to bite elephants because their skin is so thick it ends up causing the snake more injury. Oh boy. Come on Steve, just let him have a drink. Just a little bit. Oof, he's so much smaller than Steve. I don't know if he's going to be brave enough, but he's walking really, really well compared to a few days ago when I saw him. When I saw him a few days ago, he barely moved. Come on, little one. I don't think Steve's going to let him near the water's edge. Uh, by the way, I did update. I do keep providing updates to those concerned when with regard to this little boy so the, the management of the reserve is aware of him and they're monitoring his condition to see uh, how he's faring at the moment there's no they did go and check him and there's no indication that this injury was man-made it looks like a natural injury oh shame the hippo won't let you drink this is being mean come on you can do it Chris says it looks like his right rear leg is swollen as well. I mean, the wrist of the right front is definitely swollen, but you're right. I mean, that the back leg, the left back, looks much thinner and smaller than the right. Maybe he fell on his right side, and that's, what, that's why I've been struggling to tie down exactly where the injury is. Oh, it looks like he's going to get to the water without being chased by Steve. He's refused to be intimidated. Good boy. Here we go. Oh, yuck. Not, didn't like that very much. Poof. A bit of cleaner water there. Elephants are notoriously picky. Ah, oh, well done. Having a drink at the separate side of the dam to Steve. He is looking a little bit thin. So apparently lots of you wondering if a car could do that to an elephant. 
Oh, sorry, hold on one second. Yeah, AFM guys, I've been trying to follow up. I'd like to make my way in. Then, oh, sorry, I was answering a question about the car. It's it's possible, but it is highly, highly, highly unlikely. I think that is people looking for a reason to help to treat him, rather than it actually being a factual thing. I think this most likely explanation is he got shoved over by a bigger elephant, and he went over on the wrist joint and possibly the ankle joint as well. Uh, he is looking very sore, but it has massively improved. And, you know, it comes down to the conversation we so often have. And people are allowed to disagree, but ultimately it's never our decision. Ultimately it is the decision of, and it's the approach of most of South Africa, that in big open systems where nature can manage herself, she is allowed to do so. And a far more likely explanation, look, if, he'd, if there'd been obvious evidence of a bullet wound or a snare, around those limbs then he absolutely would be treated but also bear in mind that if it is a fracture or a break there is actually nothing anyone can do with elephants oh are you chiming in tingana yes no any more you've got to say no you just gave us a little saw there Mm. So the, the non-intervention issue ultimately is a decision made by people who've been doing this for a very long time and it's not made without compassion. It really isn't. But a fractured bone, there's nothing that can be done. He is thin, but I think he is recovering, to be honest. I've never seen him move like this before. I think it might be a sprain. Now, Mackle wants to know whether or not this poor Ellie could get sick from drinking this water. First of all, Mackle, welcome. It's lovely to have you on board. It's not a name that I've heard before. Secondly, no. The digestive systems of these animals and their immune systems are such that it takes a lot to actually upset them and to make them ill. So, no, he won't be made ill by that. He is absolutely fine. Look, elephants are picky if they have the choice. They will, oh, damn boy, they will definitely drink fresher water. They often dig for water as well, but it will not make him ill. Uh, you'll see as you continue to watch these live safaris, we've seen all sorts of creatures eat as well, the most unimaginable things. Green carcasses with maggots dripping off them. Sorry, I don't mean to put you off watching. I realized as I said that, that sounded quite revolting, but <laughs> my intention was not to chase you away. But no, he won't get sick from drinking this water. There will, however, be no water in about a month's time. And then it becomes more difficult. He's going to have to recover soon so that he can start covering larger distances to get to other water. Definitely, definitely walking better. Whew. Not a big snort. Where's this leopard gone? I've lost the leopard. Hang on. I think he's snorting at the leopard. Where's the leopard gone? Pretty, interestingly enough, Pretty wants to know if it could be some kind of arthritis. Look, he is a, he's a young elephant and the only, and I only know this from working at Safari Live actually, the only times that you find elephants with arthritis is when they are have been living in captivity. There is something, ooh, popcorn. Leopard urine, popcorn scent. The only time that you find elephants get arthritis is if they've been living in a circus or a zoo and they haven't moved about enough. Where's he gone, Craig? I can't see him. 
They're all looking this way, though, so he must be just below me. Mm. Is he walking? Oh, yes, there he is. Uh, which way should we look? Elephant? Okay, guys, there's a good chance my signal is about to disappear. I'm going to give you a brief look at him quickly because we can see him now. And then I'm going to have to loop up and around to get to where he's moving to. So while I do that, off you pop across to Trishala, who is still with the Evoker males. Oh, I really hope your signal doesn't disappear, Jamie. The last thing we want are gremlins today. I really hope that they don't interfere. We need to all pull some money and send them on vacation to the North Pole, preferably. <laughs> now, this guy's only moved around a little bit, but that's, of course, what I expect. But he still seems a bit restless. He's not 100% asleep. And he does get up every now and then, give us a bit of a yawn, stretch, and then he's flopped over onto the other side again. Now, we were talking about how the big cat ancestry is a bit of a mystery or sort of nobody has been able to find too much fossil evidence for them. In fact, the fossil that is has currently been found, or the most, the fossil that most closely resembles modern day lions, it's from about two million years ago in Tanzania, which is fairly recent in the whole cat lineage, to be honest, because the cat family that is normal small cats plus the big cats and all of that, they have a, a history of about 40 million years, or at least their ancestors br branched out at that point. But these pig, big cats, they have sort of a gap, so we don't really know what the kind of missing link between the small cats and the big cats is. There was also a fossil found that was three and a half million years ago, also in Tanzania. And those ones are the ones that I'm saying are, resemble this cat particularly, or resembles big cats particularly. So they are a bit of a mystery. But some recent work has actually pointed to um, an extinct animal now called Panthera blythea. which was found probably about 4.1 to 5.9 million years ago. So it adds a little bit more to their, to their lineage, a few extra years to their lineage. Laura, you would like to know if I ever feel odd or if there's ever a time when I make eye contact or feel the need to break eye contact. In fact, just when I got gotcha, here, he stared at me so intently that I felt the need to break my eye contact. And that's happened before. Not really with, well, it has happened with the evokers as well, but not intense like this was because his eyes were bright orange and had the sun coming in on it. And then he was staring at me. But the last time that it happened was with Tingana and he stared at me quite intensely and I had to actually avert my eyes. It's a, it's a creepy thing. It's almost as if you feel safer if you don't look in a weird way but uh, in the same way when you look at them then you have this kind of connection it's, it's a weird thing but I, I love it makes you feel alive as you'll see when he does turn to look at us he's got quite an intense stare even when I've taken photographs of them he particularly has a very intense gaze into your soul, almost. <laughs> he has just lifted his back leg for what appears to be nothing, because it only picked up about 10 centimeters off the ground, and then he promptly put it back down. Are you dreaming? No, you're not quite asleep.
Puma, you'd like to know if I know where lions evolved. Well, interestingly, we've always kind of assumed that they, in, they evolved in Africa. And that would be a pretty safe assumption considering how well adapted they are and how they've kind of taken over in terms of being uh, the top predator or one of the top predators. But the recent work I was telling you about where in the Himalayas they found this Panthera blythea is actually pointing to central, central northern Asia as being where they had originated. So it's quite different to what we first expected, but in that area, apparently their lineage, or at least we have evidence for their lineage at about 10.7 million years. So it's quite interesting to see how they have primarily kind of stuck around in Africa or they have been very, very successful in Africa. I always find it very interesting to think about how these animals came about and why they are the way they are. And so much of it has to do with the ecology. It's not just the animal. It's about the environment and all of that as well. Anyway, I did tell him at the top of the hour, I will be going to his brother and going to go visit him. So it is the top of the hour. So let me move on and go to the other vocal mail and check on him. In the meantime, let's go over to James and see how his search is doing. We have got some starlings, which I know are not quite as exciting as lions, but you know we are doing our best, I promise, to find you some cats. There are two different species of starlings, no less. Uh, we have got the Cape Glossy starling, the one with the yellowish eye, and in came a Birchall starling as well, the one with the black eye. I actually stopped here because there was a squirrel sitting very nicely sort of bathing in the sun. And then David threw himself around on the back of the car and the squirrel ran away. So now we are substituting the squirrel for the starlings. Also, quite a nice picture up top there, David. Uh, well, you might not like it, it's got pretty colours, but there's a, an impala sitting there. It's quite nice. I like it too. I may take an illegal photograph of it. The light is superb on it. Oh, even Faith thinks it's very beautiful. That's good. Thank you, Faith. We do what we can, you know, for the cause. One of them is going... <laughs> the other. Tim, that's a very interesting question, and the answer is very seldom do male impalas kill each other during the rut. They break their horns. I've seen a couple of eyes that have been stabbed out, which is quite unpleasant. But I have... I don't actually think I've ever seen an impala that's been killed by another impala during the rut. And if you see them having their fights, that's quite surprising. They do have some fairly vicious contra or confrontations. Um, yeah, and I'm sure they get nasty headaches but they don't seem to actually ever kill each other, which is very interesting. Kudu probably kill each other more when they get their horns locked up. They get killed quite a lot. Waterbuck apparently are responsible for the most antelope deaths, self or uh, conspecific and uh, caused deaths. I've tried to say that in a fancy way and failed horribly. Basically, waterbuck kill each other more than any other kind of antelope does. But, yeah, I mean, despite the fact that these guys seem to be much more violent, they don't tend to wipe each other out nearly the frequency that waterbuck do. I wish this bunch would try and find me a leopard. They are looking sort of in our direction. Oh, little swift, there are hundreds and hundreds of greater blue-eared glossy starlings on Juma. And in fact, the one with the yellow eye that we saw earlier could have been a greater blue-eared glossy starling. I didn't hear it call, and 
If you don't hear the, it call, it's very easy to confuse them with a Cape Glossy Starling, and in the light that we had, uh, it could easily have been a greater blue-eared Glossy Starling. We get both of them in abundance around here. So absolutely, you're obviously a bit of a birder, and for sure we get them. They make um, the easiest way to distinguish their calls. Well, I find it the easiest way. I've actually never met anybody else who knows what the hell I'm talking about, but I'm going to try and tell you. The greater blue-eared glossy starling has got a sort of swizzling, not swizzling, um, bubbling call, if you like. And the, no, it doesn't. The Cape glossy's got a bubbling call, and the greater blue-eared glossy starling has got a kind of whiny call. It goes, and So I like to think of it saying, blue, blue. Well, the Cape Glossy Starling's gentle bubbling call sounds like Cape Glossy Starling, Cape Glossy Starling, Cape Glossy Starling. So now I'm sure you'll all definitely be able to identify the difference. Not so, everyone. Good. Nice picture there, David. Thanks. David's taking a nice picture, don't you think, everybody? Fascinating, actually. I might like take an illegal one myself. <laughs> so naughty. Mine is obviously not nearly as pretty as David's. That's because David is a professional. This is a very gorgeous picture indeed. All of you agreeing that David despite his general recalcitrance, is managing to produce a gorgeous picture. Now, of course, as the sun goes down, the tracking becomes that much harder, because Herberto will have to go home fairly soon. But we will keep trying. All right, Trishala is on shift with the two evoker males. She's moved from one to the other. I have, and I did warn the mohawked male that I will be moving on soon, and it will now be his brother's show. Now another vehicle has joined us again, if you can hear the engine in the background. So everyone wants to get their eye full of these guys. Now, like I was saying before, I really hope that they'll get up a little bit earlier on the hunt. Because, of course, of the temperature and the length of the days now, the darkness that's coming is slightly earlier. Oh, hello. so cute. I hope they both are not offended by me using cute to describe them, but I do think that they are. Now, talking about hunting and them being waiting for it to cool down before they actually get on the hunt, it's actually quite relevant for something else, and that is climate change and the rising daytime temperatures. Now, we may not think that it could affect predators in this kind of way, but we know that predators don't do well in the heat, and we know that they can overeat, overheat easily. And if it is hotter in the days, in during the day, then the time that they can actually invest in possibly what they would have hunted, even if it was towards the end of the day or just when the sun is I'll be affected. Maybe even those times when they may be active are no longer good enough for them because it's too hot. So that's actually an implication of global warming that we don't often think of. And especially for wild dogs, this can be very true because they will hunt in the day. And when they do that, that time that they can invest in hunting is really really shortened not only is it shortened the intensity of the heat while they are on the hunt for those few 
parts of the day when it is cool enough is still going to be higher than they would normally be exposed to. So there's also those type of things to think about. And especially when it comes to male lions and of course the mane and the testosterone that's involved in the growth of the mane has a lot to do or apparently has a lot to do with temperature and climate. So if the lion was in an area where it was particularly hot, then that can actually influence how and it grows its mane or the darkness to which it grows its mane and the length to which it's grow it grows its mane. But apparently the length at which or how long the mane is only really matters between males sizing themselves up and doesn't actually matter to the females and that the color is what matters to the females. We're talking about temperature. Let's actually have a look at his mane, even though it's we can't see it too well, but it's nice and thick, whereas the other male's mane is slightly less thick. And apparently, in the heat, this mane is very uncomfortable. And you would think so. I would think so. You have this horrible, really big scarf around your neck constantly. But that means that females think you can deal better with the climate than the other males do. So all these little pieces of the puzzle kind of fitting in the evolutionary puzzle. Anyway, hopefully he will get up in a little bit. In the meantime, let me send you over to Jamie with her cat hopefully doing something. Of course, Tingana doesn't have a mane, but he is still intimidating in his own right. He has a dewlap instead, which is a massive sort of pouch of skin that extends from his jaw right down to his chest. And right now, he's fixated on something in the bush. He, I think he spotted some impala, and he is definitely in need of a nice meal. He's not the chubby Tingana that we are so accustomed to seeing. His ever-present limp is there. It was worse when he got up earlier. It's now sort of stretched out and warmed up. But life is about to get quite difficult for us because he is definitely interested in something in this, in this vegetation. His ears, of course, far more powerful than ours. He's obviously picked up the sound of movement. doesn't necessarily have to be Impala. I went quiet there just to listen because I thought I heard Impala rutting. But I think it is a sign of his age that he is looking so thin during rutting season because it really is, it becomes so much easier for the predators uh, to catch themselves male Impala that you don't generally see thin looking leopards at this time of year. Maybe he's just had a run of bad luck, I suppose. He's been absent enough that I thought he was on a kill. Okay, let's go catch him. I'll catch him, obviously. For our new viewers, I'm not going to go and grab him. This is good. South, south is good. We like south. South is away from Bufflesock. Where are you going? Onto that termite mound. No, oh, we're changing direction. We are sitting on a termite mound. I just want to see where, I'm trying to see what he's seen. No. Kathy wants to know if Tingana would ever attempt to go after the injured elephant. I'm oh, sorry guys, there's another vehicle. Uh, okay, cool, all right, stand by. Sorry, Craig, we'll, uh, we'll shuffle around there. Mm. We obviously can't put people on camera. So, oh, if, if we can avoid it, so I've got to just reposition. Mm, no, that, that elephant is too big for Tingana. There's no way. If that elephant died naturally, yes, he would. He'd eat it. Hello, my boy. I'm sorry. I'm going to have to sneak quite close to you. But I don't see your, your hunting target yet, so I think you'll be okay with that. Hey, mister. Here we go about as good as I can do for now. I wonder if he's found a water burrow, if that's what he's heard summing in these holes. That would be exciting for tonight. So while I speculate, poor James has been doing a lot of speculating and that hasn't necessarily worked out in his favor yet.
What we have got here, however, is a hyena, and it's ribbon, as far as I can tell. And I'm going to follow her, because I think she might be as effective a tracker as any out here. And I believe the den was active a little bit earlier, and therefore I'm sure she's just left it. And is possibly leading us to where she can smell some meat. So I think we shall follow, don't you, David? Yes, let's. Now, interestingly, when you do follow a hyena off-road, you've got to keep your distance, because they don't tolerate it quite as well as lions and leopards do. But they also tend to walk in straighter directions. So you can give them a little bit more space. There she is. And often along well-worn paths. So let's see where she takes us. I um, don't know if any of you managed to get a good enough view there to decide if that was ribbon, but I'm pretty sure it was from the ear that looks like a bee. Not a buzzy bee, a bee. Letter B. Letter B. And also, she could just be heading to the dam cam for a bit of a drink. Mm, no, she's turning. Chris, I don't think your hyena would ever intentionally lead us in a, the wrong direction, no. Um, she felt threatened enough and we were near a den and she thought we were after her, maybe she might. She's definitely smelling something. Look at her. See? Oh, here we go. Here we go. She's picked something up on the wind. Hold on tight, everybody. David, where'd she go? She go to the right there. You got her, have you? One o'clock, going at high speed. Oh, this is a nasty patch of ground with some dirty stumps. <laughs> there she goes. What her smelling? That is fantastic. Now that's the block that Herbert's in, tracking. Now, I don't think he is in any danger whatsoever from her. But I think that her intentions are precisely the same as his. Isn't that amazing? I'm going to turn her head to the little breeze. The... I'm just going to let her try and get a direction. running now. Oh, she's going straight into the block, everybody. This is going to get a bit rough. You can see her running off here. Oh, we are. You see her there, Dave? She went up there towards the left. Exactly where Herbert was going. We're going to hand you back over to Jamie while we try and figure out what's going on here. Very exciting stuff. All right, so while James unravels that puzzle, or that ribbon, haha, we are trying to unravel a mystery of our own. Has Tingana seen something in the distance, or is he deliberately... Yeah, he has going to wait it out on this termite mound. This termite mound is active. It is an active burrow. Oh, the grass seeds in the eyes. Hey, my boy. Mark his territory. Oh, his face looks a lot thinner. Do you know that I got chivied? I got chivied. Somebody said shoe to me when they moved in to see the leopard. I was quite appalled. Oh, head. There we go. Now you can see him. 
Here he goes. And he's definitely either seen or heard something off in the distance. Now it's going to be tricky now as he moves through this area. I don't like this block, but oh well. Now Lauren, you want to know if the female leopards will find the larger dewlaps attractive. Mm, no, not necessarily, but biological selection will favor males with a large dewlap because it means they can get an ideal territory that a... Hold on, hold on, hold on. I just gotta make sure I don't lose him. So just bear with me. Oh, spiderweb, Craig. I'll save you. I didn't save you, I'm sorry. I did my best. Mm. So they'll obviously be able to compete. Generally, a bigger dewlap means a bigger size leopard, competes for better territory, meaning that... No problem. Meaning that they therefore are potentially attractive to females in this area. But to be honest, females are attracted to a male. And, oh, there he is. There's a hole there. That's what he's after. Let's go have a look. Mm. Sophia, sorry. <laughs> trying, really struggling to concentrate on everything happening. Mm. So a female leopard will mate with any possible partner because that will ensure her safety of her cubs. Okay, while I get into position here, let's go across to James, who, by the sound of the game drive radio, has found something potentially interesting. Uh, south into the block. Right, everybody, we found what she's got. She's got a um, rotting porcupine. She's found a rotting porcupine. Herbie said this is exactly where he had the fresh tract, but this animal is rotten. You can smell it. You can't, obviously. You were quite lucky you can't. It's unbelievable. Look at that. I'm sure Tlalamba would have tried to feed on it, even if she wasn't, if it wasn't her that killed the porcupine. This is the first porcupine I've seen here, Ajuma. Absolutely foul stink coming off. How's that? Isn't that amazing? So this is Ribbon. Now, Ribbon is not a high-ranking member of the Juma clan, and so let, we, let us see if the theory plays out that the lower rankers will not take food back towards the den, and indeed she's not heading anywhere near the den. Just to also keep a high lookout for the possibility of Tlalamba being right around here. Yeah, no, hyena, if you manage to eat that thing, I tell you what, you've got a stomach second to none, because the odor coming off it is profound. Is she taking it though? Their noses are so amazing. It is amazing, isn't it? It is unbelievable. But that thing's been dead at least two days. It really does niff something cruel. I'm not sure where she's trying to take it. I'm just going to try and keep my distance a bit there. So I know this might not be the best picture, but. She seems a little bit like she's trying to get it away from us. Oh, yes, Tim, the quills can still hurt her for sure. The only difference is, of course, that they are not attached to them. Well, they are attached, but they are not attached to working muscles, which means that the porcupine cannot sort of face them and make them stiff and point them at the hyena, and she also can't back into the hyena. She's having a full go now. Oh my goodness, she's now scratching herself 
on the quills or possibly trying to pick up the smell of the rotting carcass. Glad on, it's not my dinner tonight. David, I'm going to try and get us a little bit closer so we can at least get a slightly better view. Oh, would Tingana scavenge this meal from ribbon? Uh, he might, he might. It's a female hyena, uh, a small female hyena, uh, probably a slightly lighter than Tingana, not much though, and not a dominant hyena, so he might try his luck. She's covering herself now in the stink of this thing. Darv, is that all right? Now, let's just keep an eye out because there'll be a little lepidus somewhere around here. Absolutely astounding. I mean, I'm assuming that that's the porcupine's blood and not her own. It's a little bit like getting some ice cream, David, and then pushing your face into it. to leave it there. You're just going to leave it. Janet, you're a new viewer and you say, am I scared being close to her like this? No, I'm not, Janet. Janet, the reason is that she's used to our vehicles, she's used to us, and she doesn't see us or the vehicles as a threat, and most importantly, she doesn't see us as something to eat. And nor, apparently, does she see that a porcupine is something to eat. I'm going to leave the carcass there because I want to follow this hyena. I think she may well lead us to our ultimate goal, which is Tlalamba, of course. Or Tandy. Fascinating. Wasn't that incredible? So, like I said, I wonder if Tlalamba didn't kill that porcupine and then reject it because it was too difficult to eat and then it's been rotting for two days, at least. It's getting dark now. See if she goes back towards the den. The den is down off to my left-hand side there. And she's not going towards there. She's going back sort of towards where she found the carcass. I can smell it. In fact, we're driving exactly on our own tracks here. might just be going for a drink. Woof, that's quite a niff. All righty, the sun has gone, it's getting dark, and I'm sure the evokers are going to get up soon. I'm sure they will, and I really hope that they do. And I have a feeling they will, because I think they're hungry. I do. Their stomachs are not particularly large. But they definitely don't look unhealthy. They both look in great condition. You can see the light's gotten a bit pink, which is because, of course, the setting sun has cast them in its lovely light. Very, very pretty. Now, we were talking about manes, and we spoke about the testosterone influence on the manes of the, of the males. Now, typically, only males have manes, but there have been a few incidences of females having manes as well. I can recall one in Botswana, or a few females in Botswana, possibly, that grew manes and started actually to behave a bit like 
male lions and they would scent mark often and call often or more often than females normally do because males will call and scent mark more often than the females do and it's starting to behave in that way so that sort of tells us that there must be quite a direct link between having the mane and the amount of testosterone in the animal. In fact, there was another example. It was in South Africa, but I can't recall where exactly. And there was a female that had a mane as well. And it was found that she actually had an issue with her ovaries and she was producing more testosterone. And after it, she had sorted that out or the vet had sorted that out, she returned to normal lioness behavior, calling less and scent marking less. So there kind of gives us the direct link between testosterone and the mane. But of course, there might be a lot more other genes and chemicals that are influencing it. But for sure, testosterone does play a key role. This is what I'm waiting for. I'm waiting for the very slow waking up that the lions do before they get up for the night. Tweet, tweet. You are a new viewer. Welcome aboard. So glad to have you with us. You would like to know if the evokers would form a new pride. Well, there's a few things to talk about there. Firstly, males like the evokers, they form coalitions. So when males are about three years old, they're kind of pushed out of their pride by the adult males, and then they form a coalition in the years to come. And sometimes that can take them a bit of time, but eventually most of them do, although you do get some nomadic males. And a pride uh, is the group of females and their offspring, and a pride would sort of belong to a coalition. So the evokers won't make or create their own pride or try to join their own pride. They are already part of a group or family of lions that we have here, and they form a coalition that is males that are working together. And of course, the females, the pride, they always come together and they'll see each other very often, but the males will leave for a long time, um, sometimes weeks. Uh, I haven't seen them with the Nkuhumas, but the Nkuhumas also move around quite a bit. And sometimes a male coalition or the territory that a male coalition occupies can overlap quite a few prides so that a few prides can belong to a lion and that is of course an area where the lions are really at a high density but in an area like this from what I know the evokers are linked only at the moment to our coalition the Nkuhumas and I think the torchwood pride but I am not sure about the sticks so, in fact, if you guys know, you can actually let me know. Because I do know the Torchwood Pride and the Inkahuma Pride do belong to them. Am I thinking, am I leaving anybody out? Telmati Pride as well? Oh, there are impalas rutting all around us. And that's the noise that I'm hearing. So that's why I'm hoping that these guys will get up and start to pick off what is really easy prey for the moment. Considering that their condition will be kind of low. Um, the impalas, that is, that I'm talking about. So, tweet, tweet, back to your question. The, um, the, inco the evokers will not form their own pride. Ah. Rob, you'd like to know if I know where the third evoker is? I don't know where the third evoker is, but in my experience with them, I have noticed that when two of them are kind of down this, way, uh, down this side, the other one usually hangs around a bit, a bit more to the north. Now, that's just something I've observed. I don't know if that's where he is right now. But in my past experience, that is what I've seen. Now, I said I was waiting for this. I was waiting for the slow awakening of the lions, which is what happens around this time when the sun is setting. And it starts with a few movements, some stretching, some yawning. Then there's, of course, the defecating that goes on. They relieve themselves and then they are on the move. So this is a good sign that he's turned over. 
goat face. You would like to know how old the Avoca males are. Well, they were born in 2013. So I don't know exactly which month they were born. It's a sort of hard, especially if you haven't followed them from cubs. But I'm sure someone out there knows exactly which month they were born in. But 2013 is the year. So either they're coming on six or they are already six years old. David, interesting question. You'd like to know if it's always the same one that's missing or do they kind of rotate? Well, it's not always the same one that's missing because I have seen them all. So I suppose they do sort of rotate. But also, they're not constantly sticking by each other's side within a few meters, you know. They can always go off on their own and explore a bit and then come back or regroup. But I have seen them all. In fact, I've seen them all in on one day as well on Juma. So they must rotate in a way. Or I guess it's also a bit of chance. This one feels like coming this way. Oh, are you dreaming? There was a small jaw shudder there. <laughs> Right now he is moving, even in the slightest, and just the fact that he's moving is making me slightly happy. So let's see what they may get up to once the sun is completely down. In the meantime, let me send you over to James and see how his search is going for Tlalaba. Real stuck. It's tremendously exciting. Hold on, David. You holding on? Yep. Everybody holding on? Oops, the daisies. Okay, our hyena is now along this game path on which our leopards have often traveled. We've just passed Herbie, he's on his way home, and he says he's convinced this leopard is still around this area. He's had tracks going up and down from this morning and from this afternoon, and he's convinced that they stole something from her, but that she's still in the area. And I think that this hyena is also convinced of the same thing. So we are going to do our level best to follow her. Can you see her anymore, David? No. Not at the moment, no. Just make use of the spot light. <laughs> this is not an easy place to be driving. In fact, it's semi-impossible. Now, I think we're going to have to go back out onto the road and see if we can make our way around to where this game path terminates. Susan, I think there are two reasons she'd have abandoned that carcass and not carried it to the den. The first reason is that she's a low-ranking hyena and therefore, rather than take meat back to the den, Often low-ranking hyenas will eat away, there she is, they'll eat away from the den and then sort of convert their energy, if you like, into milk and take the milk back for their cubs because only their own cubs will suckle from them. Uh, the other reason is I think that it was obviously just distasteful. It was very rotten. That's not normally much of, oh, jeepers. That's not normally much of a deterrent, but I, I don't know why necessarily she thought that one was particularly more distasteful than any other. Perhaps it was the quills and she realized that it was just going to be too difficult and not worth her while to pick it clean before she ate it. And I suspect that was probably had something to do with it. She was going along this little game path here. This is really, there she is. Um, have you got her, Dave? There, you can just see her disappearing. Fantastic. Okay, let's continue. <laughs> I do think we should keep following her, though. I think it's going to be worth our while. And she's been relatively confiding as well for a hyena. Like I say, they don't often let us follow them. Oops, off-road. David, you're still there. 
good. It's a relief. Mm -hmm. Times like these that I wish I was driving a bulldozer. <laughs> All right, let's go back to Trisha, I think, and see if we can't find this in some privacy. Uh, and you can maybe find uh, the evoker's calling. That would be nice. Well, my line has gotten up, so I'm so glad about that. It's only a matter of time, so we are ready. I've got my jacket on, and we are ready to keep up with him. What are you going to do? This is always a really nice time of the night because what happens is you slowly get this build up and sort of a suspense on where are they going to go and what are they going to do because when it comes to this time, that's when they want to be up and they are on the hunt. And I did tell you there are some impala around and he kind of just now gave a, see, see that movement of the head kind of forward. Oh, big yawn. Beautiful. He was starting to want to give a small roar earlier. So I think he will roar for us tonight. Dangerously simple. You'd like to know if lions dream. Well, for one, I wouldn't really know, but I can tell you about what I think or from what I've read because it's hard to conclusively kind of know if lions do or not, if any animal really does or not. But dreaming is associated with REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep. And it's the same with us. When we are in REM sleep, that's when we dream. So whether the lion actually has REM sleep, which I think it would considering the amount of time that it sleeps for, then there's nothing stopping it from being able to dream. So I would imagine that they could. I know for certain that elephants do go through a period of REM sleep. Hello, you handsome boy. So there's no reason why they shouldn't be able to dream. Look at those eyes. Stunning eyes. Do any of you feel the need to avert your eyes? <laughs> but he has quite a gentle stare. Now he was sort of really softly trying to call and I wonder if he was trying to get the attention of his brother nearby. Jean, you'd like to know if I'm not scared that I'm sitting this close to him? Um, I think at first I probably was, but now that I'm used to them and I'm used to their behavior and I've learned a lot about their behavior, it's a lot better. In fact, that sort of fear factor goes away. And that is testament to knowledge is power because so many things we're scared of, if only we, were, we actually took the time to learn about them, we'd realize that they're actually not that scary. There are times, like when the mohawked male that's behind us stared at me. Like I said, he has a very intense stare. Oh, let's listen. Come on, boy. He just gave a slight contact call now. I have a feeling he's going to try and get together with his brother and then they will move off together into the night. Come on, boy. <laughs> no, he's decided not to perform on cue just yet. He's, he's still warming up, but he will get there. Oh, there we go. Oh, man. Stunning. Okay, I'm just going to be quiet for... There we go. Come, boy. 
try one more. warming up but wasn't that amazing that sound is unbelievable it kind of sends a vibration through and when my mm. feet oh there you go again when my feet are actually on the metal of, of the car at the bottom mm. of the pedals oh you can hear the vibration go again mm. Was that not unbelievable? In fact, I'm going to one word tweet this. You guys need to tell me what your one word is. Hashtag Safari Live because that was epic. And if you were listening closely, you would have heard there's another lion responding really, really softly in the background. Oh, that was exciting. What are you going to do? I think my one word would be awe. Absolutely awestruck. Like I was saying to you, that is so loud and you can feel the vibration kind of go from your feet that's touching the metal up into your body. Kimberly, your one word is magnificent, absolutely. It's just magnificence at its finest. I'm wondering who is going to come and join him here. Because his brother is nearby. Cat, you'd like to know if the roaring is a dominant thing or dominance thing or is it just a communication thing? It there are different types of roars. You will get a contact call which is kind of sounds like a the beginning of a roar, hmm, like that. And then of course you'll get the full blown roar. Now, these obviously get used at different times and for different things, but a lot of the time, in general, it's going to be a deterrent to any other lions that are in the area. So I suppose it can, any roar kind of acts as a territorial marker anyway. Well, I'm going to stick around with him and hopefully his brother will join him soon. Maybe the third brother will too. Who knows? In the meantime, let me send you over to the other two cats and that is Jamie and Tingana. Okay, well, that was probably one of the more stressful periods in my week. Um, he took us all the way into a round-leafed teak thicket and within round-leafed teak thickets, one often finds artfark burrows, which is, of course, what he wanted. But it was an absolute nightmare, and we lost him completely. And if it hadn't been for the other vehicle, we actually never would have found him. 
Well, we would have. He is calling, so we would have actually found him, but... Phew, that was exhausting. I thought I was so scared that he was going to settle down outside the entrance to one of those burrows where I couldn't see him. I mean, that thicket was impenetrable. And that that was where he was going to stay the whole night. That I am deeply relieved to tell you that he's back out on the road, and I can only hope he decides to sit here for the next... however long it may be. I'm not even sure how much longer we've got left of the TV show. I'm not even sure where I am in space or time. It's a mark of how much work I did trying to follow him, and Craig too, that even though it's really quite chilly now, I am boiling. I am absolutely boiling. And the problem with round leaf teak thickets, as most of you will know, is that the elephants actually farm them. So they keep them, they browse them down to a certain size, but a lot of the time there's hidden stumps below these tiny scraggly looking bushes that are, as you would have guessed with the name teak, completely solid. And they're just waiting to take out a steering arm. And that combined with the paranoia of once again following to Ghana and falling into an art folk hole was po positively unmanageable. And we did some very slow first gear driving. Anyway, the Duke failed in his efforts to find himself an art folk or a warthog, which I think is what he was after. No. Those of you wondering if I heard the evokers roaring, I heard nothing except the sound of my own heartbeat and the odd crunch and crackle of leaves as I attempted to move around here. So no, I haven't heard them. We are on the opposite side of Juma. We're actually about as far east as Trishala is far west. If that makes any sense, she's on the western. There, I can hear them. I think. There, I could actually hear them. But we're on the eastern boundary, north eastern corner. <laughs> okay, apparently Trishala's lines aren't roaring, so I'm hearing something else. Tweet, tweet, welcome to our live safaris. Tweet, tweet, I don't know whether you're tweeting or whether or not you are in the comments section of the YouTube chat, but or whatever you call it. Mm, you want to know if leopards usually hunt at night? They do. It really depends upon the, uh, the leopard itself. So it's, no, I was just trying to make a tweeting joke, I'm sorry. Mm, it was lame. The, the leopards, I've seen leopards hunt during the day, I've seen leopards hunt at night. They probably do, on the balance of things, they probably do the majority of their hunting at night. It's where their stealth really comes into its own. And they're probably most successful at night. But I have seen leopards hunt at all hours, often in the middle of the day. I've seen this male leopard walk around when it's 48 degrees centigrade outside. Uh, it really depends upon how hungry the leopard is. It's full moon at the moment, which also makes life a bit more difficult for the predators, because it means that the prey animals can see slightly, e slightly easier, slightly more easily. They can see more. I can't speak. That does not bode well. They can see more. And the moon, of course, increases the ambient light, and even as a human being, you'll find that you, <laughs> Faith's laughing at me, <laughs> only 10 seconds delayed because of our delay. Mm. <laughs> I'm trying, I swear. It's also embarrassing because I'm right, parked right on top of another vehicle. I'm just gonna turn Trish down. Thank you, Trish, for that update. What was I saying? Light, oh yes, you'll find even as a human, if you move about during full moon, you can really see. Paula, I know, he does look so comfy, doesn't he? I do hope he stays comfy. In fact, if he could stay there for the next mm, little while, I would be profoundly grateful. He's got to stay 36 minutes in the same place. Okay, Faith is going with an hour, so he only gets up halfway through the TV show. I'm okay with that. I can do half an hour on a flat Tingana and then half an hour on a moving Tingana. I can handle that. Actually, I quite like that good idea of Faith. Because if he gets moving in the next 36 minutes, there's a chance he'll be off the property before the end of the TV show. 
We should have a betting pool going for our TV shows, don't you think? Not, of course, that I'm encouraging gambling. Evokers cross, I would say f three to one odds. Tingana crosses five to one odds. James, James finds um, Tlalamba. <laughs> Not gonna say anything. <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> Tingana soars. Very strong possibility he's about to do that now. so good. Those of you wondering about the light coming on and off, it is a, another guest vehicle who's with us in the sighting, enjoying Tingana. Nothing wrong with it at all. Mm. It just has to do with, oh, here we go. Sit down. It basically, you know, he's an adult male leopard. It doesn't bother his eyes at all because of the way that um, leopards, no, 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 please no. Please no. Please no. Please not back in there. Not now, Tingana. So it just reflects off the membrane, but we don't, because we have cameras that are able to see using infrared light, then we don't need to worry about spotlights, but we do still use them. Oh no, in situations like this. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks guys. Much appreciated. Thanks. <laughs> I don't have time for morning. He's going to disappear so quickly. Okay, bye-bye, guys. You're going off to Trish while I concentrate for the end of the safari. I will catch you shortly. Yes, you need to concentrate, Jamie. I hope that she'll be able to keep up with Tingana, but this has been such an awesome evening. We've had so much vocalization, and this guy is just getting started because he's still doing the beginning of his roar every now and then. And I have a feeling he's going to sit and wait until he's joined by the others, or one of the others, before he actually gets off and moves. Because I would have actually thought that after he moves up or gets up and starts moving around and starts actually turning and yawning and stretching, that's when they actually get up and start moving. But he's waited, so I have a feeling that it's only a matter of time until the, the other one's going to come along and then they're going to go on the hunt for the evening, which is so exciting. It would be really, really, really such a pleasure for me. And I really hope that they maybe get up before you guys have to go, which would be awesome. Now there are other vehicles with us, there are two others, and that's the light that you're seeing there. But this has been an absolute pleasure. Are you going to lift your head up to say goodbye? Maybe you can give us a hut for goodbye. <laughs> no, I'm asking too much. A roar to say goodbye would be awesome. What do you say, fella? David, you say this has been an amazing drive. It truly has. I mean, when this guy was roaring, Seb and I were high-fiving behind the camera because it was awesome. And he is so close, and that sound is so special. It's like nothing else. Stunning. Well, I think that I'll check on the other male soon as well see if he's also laying down and maybe they'll be looking for the third brother that they're calling for well i did hear the lion contact calling back earlier so who knows it's very very exciting but thank you all of course for your questions and your comments but is that time so see you in the morning for the sunrise safari